There's a useful characterization of contractions when you're talking about differentiable functions. For example, it's a fact that any differential function, differentiable function on a closed interval from AB to AB is a contraction if and only if there exists a number k that's less than 1, a non-negative number k less than 1, such that the derivative is bounded by that value of k for all x in AB. And there's a similar statement that could be said for higher dimensional uh, functions in terms of the Jacobian. From this fact, we can get a bunch of, um, a bunch of results. For example, cosine is not a contraction. I'll leave, I'll leave these checks for you as exercises. All you have to do is calculate the derivative. Right? It's kind of obvious. Um, take the derivative, it's, you get plus or minus sine, and um, that, that actually achieves its uh, maximum at 1. However, if you take cosine and apply it to itself again, so if you consider this function, and I'll write this function, uh, it's a little confusing to write it as cosine squared in this particular case, but I'll write it as cosine composed with cosine. So this function is a contraction, and I'll leave you to check that. You can use this theorem, this fact again. You could use this fact also to show that sine applied to itself any number of times is not a contraction. So why are these facts important? Well, we showed that cosine has a fixed point, at least uh, intuitively. I didn't actually prove that those sequences were Cauchy, but um, it's true. And yet we found a fixed point, but if you notice, B tells us that cosine applied to itself is a contraction. And this leads us to a great theorem with even more applications that if I have a complete metric space and a function from it to itself such that the nth iterate, so there exists some natural number n with f to the nth power. So this means the nth iterate of f, this is n times, is a contraction. So even if f is not a contraction, but if some power of it is a contraction, then there exists a unique fixed point. And in fact, for any x, for any initial condition, the sequence x naught, f of x naught, f of f of x naught converges to that fixed point. And the proof of this theorem relies on the proof of the original mapping contraction theorem. So we know that fn is a contraction. And by the previous theorem, we know that there exists a unique fixed point. Not for f, but for fn. So let me call that fixed point y. So let me just write this out. fn y equals y. Set z equal to f of y. So I'm going to take my point, which I know is fixed under the nth iterate of x, on the, the nth iterate of n, and now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this next point. So if I apply the nth iterate of f to z, what do I get? By definition, this is just f of y. And since function composition is associative, I can rewrite this as f f n y. And by the mapping contraction theorem from earlier, 
we know that this is f of y. But by definition of f of y, this is z. In other words, z is also a fixed point of fn. But we know by uniqueness, since n is a contraction, z equals y. In other words, since z is f of y, f of y equals y. And therefore, y is also a fixed point of f. So we found our fixed point. And the only thing left to check is that now consider the sequence before. For an arbitrary initial condition, and what we want to show is that that sequence converges to this fixed point. So let me rewrite this sequence in a very suggestive manner. Let's write x naught, f of x naught, f of f of x naught, f two of x naught, and so on, until f n minus one x naught. And here let me write f n x naught. And again, this sequence is going in this direction. So let me write that out. And then it goes back in this direction. All I'm doing is I'm rewriting it. And we're going to see that this is actually a useful way to think about um, the sequence. This is f of, sorry, f n of f of x naught. And then this is f n of f squared of f of x naught, and so on. And hopefully you get the idea now. This is fn, fn minus 1, x naught. And keep going. And what you notice is that, so this is our entire sequence. And we know that each of the horizontal subsequences of this entire sequence converges by the previous theorem because fn is a contraction. Again here, fn is a contraction, so think of this point here as being x1, and you're just applying fn iteratively to x1, and that also converges to the fixed point. And by uniqueness of that previous theorem, all of those fixed points in these horizontal subsequences converge to the same unique fixed point. And therefore, this entire sequence converges to that same fixed point. And that's actually the end of the proof. And I realized I forgot to mention, uniqueness gave us that z is a fixed, sorry, that y is a fixed point of f as well, but we didn't prove that that's the unique fixed point of f. Um, I should also mention that, so let me, this is a little ad hoc, but let me squeeze this in here. Um, suppose W is another fixed point of F. So then we have W equals F of W. And because it's a fixed point, we can apply F iteratively to W. And we'll get F and W. But this shows us that W is a fixed point of Fn. And Fn is a contraction. And by the contraction mapping theorem from before, that implies that its fixed point is also unique. And because we already have a fixed point of Fn, that's y, this implies that y equals w. And therefore, the only fixed point of f is indeed that fixed point of the nth iterate of f as well. And so that actually ends the proof of this theorem and gives a justification to why cosine has a unique fixed point.